Does it work? There's a there are two plates. Yeah, we just need to get It'll test out. Oh, it's just it's a point. oh really? <laughs> we we all? Uh, so we need just two speakers. We're gonna come up here. So we need two vacant chairs. Uh, can it yeah, be here? Two, yeah, so please one, two, three. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. We keep them. Please. Okay, we're all set to go. Welcome everybody uh, in this session. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Annelies Witthoff, so I work at the IKEA Foundation uh, as a program manager in the Agri portfolio. And I'm going to moderate. Is this like a. It's a music music. going. Are we? It's <laughs> musical. <laughs> I'm not normally musical. So <laughs> okay. Uh, so this session is all going to be about making the case, the business case for regenerative agriculture and agroecology. Uh, and the role of finance in supporting these business cases. So we talked this morning uh, already about uh, the intertwining of the food system and the energy system. We talked about frameworks, we talked about metrics, about uh, accountability uh, and data, the need for data. And all these conversations really pointed to the need for and to the potential of the business case for agroecology or, or regenerative agriculture. And all these examples, all the stories that we've heard this morning were about how this is rooted in the economic business case, really. The economic business case, first and foremost, for the farmers. How does it work for them, for their <coughs> income, for their livelihoods, for their lives, really? Uh, but also for the industry and the agri-food industry. How does it work for larger companies? How does, how does it work for small and medium enterprises? And then also, it needs to be a business case for government. Uh, does it make sense uh, in socioeconomic perspective for governments to invest in this, uh, for society at large, really, when they build up their budgets and, and look at how they can grow their, their countries? So we will have four speakers here uh, lined up for you who will uh, each speak to uh, give some insights on their own perspective, coming from the farmer uh, side or from the corporate side, uh, from uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, and then after that, we will give space to two other speakers, so we'll do a bit of a shift here, uh, who can then shine their lights on what the case of finance is, how private sector finance has a role, how public sector finance has a role to play. And if all goes well, then we will also close off with um, some insights from the scientific community, from Dr. Songwei, uh, talking about their upcoming FSEC report. All that is going to happen in one hour or even less. <laughs> so I am going to uh, be quick in kicking everybody off with this session. So we're welcoming on stage Vijay Kumar, who is really the ambassador of Andhra Pradesh, I may say, Thank you. Uh, and a champion of uh, community-based natural farming. Uh, we have Sue Ogilvie here, who is the program director at MacDoc uh, Foundation, the Farming for the Future program. We have Fabricio Muriana, from the executive director from Instituto Regenera, if I pronounce it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> and we have Jesse McGee over uh, at the end, who is the director of global sustainability at McCain Foods. So each of you are going to talk about how you are delivering the business case. And let me start with you, uh, Vijay Kumar. Just to, as a reminder, each of you has about three minutes to speak about this. Um, and for you, what I would like you to talk about is a true cost accounting study that was done in Andhra Pradesh and that, that really compared the economic, social, health impacts uh, of different farming um, uh, systems in India uh, and in, India, in Andhra Pradesh in particular. Uh, can you share some insights from that study to us and particularly those that relate to the economic impact uh, that can help policymakers but also investors to redefine their financial decision-making criteria. Okay. Uh, I think I, I don't like this idea of a business case. <laughs> <laughs> it is a survival case. You want to survive or you don't want to survive. Simple. Now, you also want to wear an economic hat. Our experience we now have close to 1 million farmers in Andhra Pradesh transitional, transitioning to this, and we have to reach out to another 6 million farmers. So already 14% of farmers are on this journey. And various studies show that farmers are making money. Transition is not painful. Transition is an opportunity. And there are huge benefits to consumers 
to the soil, to the water. So it's something which everybody, government, the banks, the consumers, the industry, so they all need to come together to take it forward. I, I just want to, I'm not happy with the word business case. I really would like, because we're in a very serious trouble. So the Titanic has crashed. We are searching for lifeboats. Do we have a good lifeboat or not? So let us have that sense of urgency that it is some normal business case and then you know we need have some decades to discuss about it. So first of all that. The second, the true cost accounting study in our case showed that there's a fantastic in quotes business case even though I don't like the word. <laughs> More money, better for health and greater social capital created through this. Uh, but I also want to you know, there is a discussion happening that there are externalities in the conventional agriculture which are not costed, so the food is really not cheap, so there must, it must be costed adequately. But I want to ask all of you, who has the courage to cost it adequately? People are happy with the way things are happening. So then I took it as a challenge. It should be profitable even with the conventional agriculture enjoying all those idiotic externalities. <laughs> so I must make a case so strong that through natural farming, farmers see it as a transition opportunity, make more money in the first year itself and make more money in the subsequent years, improve soil and improve <coughs> environment. But there is a fantastic business case for the government. In India, the government spends $27 billion in fertilizer subsidies. And uh, so the government of India has taken a decision that any state government which reduces fertilizer consumption, so 50% of the subsidy save will be given to the states to expand the program. And then we, in our state, you know, there's also electricity for pumping water, which is again a huge subsidy. My state alone spends $1.25 billion every year. And so the deal, I save about 30 to 50% water through natural farming. So the deal with my government is that they should give me 50% of whatever I'm saving. So they're very clear savings for government. And uh, so definitely government should invest in it. There's also a case for philanthropies to invest in incubating this. Because still, you know, proof of concept on ground is jalo. We Thank will you. get to that yeah, in the second sure. session, uh, as it will speak about how to finance the case. But I wanted to build on, on what you said about the importance of true cost accounting and natural farming, the role of nature. Uh, and, and the true costing as a lifeline also for farmers uh, in this situation. I want to turn to you, Sue. Um, so Farming for the Future is a research program, right, on how you uh, can reveal the contribution of nature and make that accessible to farmers as a lifeline, I guess, and as an, a source of income. So can you talk us, uh, to us about what you have res uh, learned from that research? Yeah, I'm very happy to. So. One of the things, and Vijay's already mentioned it, is that a barrier to a farmer transitioning or investing in their natural capital or improving their environmental performance, an important barrier is their fear that it might come at a cost to their farm business and prevent them from doing things like, you know, sending their kids to school, paying for the dentist and, you know, really important things. Um, but our, our view would be that that question has never been answered. We actually have not got the evidence to actually inform farmers of whether that is a real fear or whether that's not the case at all. So what Farming for the Future has been designed to do is to get that evidence base. So we have um, 
got a sample of 130 livestock producers through various regions of Australia. We've measured their uh, natural capital, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a sec. We've measured their natural capital in a very fine scale, very rigorous way, and we've got five years' worth of production and financial data, and we're analysing that to see whether the farms that are at high natural capital are actually performing more poorly than the farms with low natural capital. So when I say natural capital, when we talk about natural capital on a farm, we're talking about all the different ecosystem assets you'd have, the remnant native vegetation, the intensified cropping soils. In Australia, we've got grassy woodlands, widely spaced trees that are really terrific for livestock production. You can have your biodiversity and your livestock production in those systems. So we make it very uh, tractable to, to measure the natural capital. We try to make it as boring as possible so that actually farmers recognise, well, that's what we do. We measure, we, we manage those things. And what we're seeing from the early findings in our research is that there's no reason to really believe that investing in your natural capital comes at a cost to your farm business. And what we're also revealing is that there's different pathways to greater resilience in the farm business. So the different pathways are improved profit, uh, productivity, improved gross margins, as VJ says, you know, when you're getting nature to give you a whole pile of inputs for free and a whole pile of ecosystem services, then you, you're actually getting a financial benefit. But perhaps the most interesting uh, thing we're seeing is that there seems to be um, an indication that farms' business performance in response to different seasons becomes less variable when we see more natural capital. And so what I would emphasise is that um, this research is, is very early um, and what we need to be doing is really keeping um, a, a close eye on the, the people that need to know the answers, which is the farmers and the farm advisors and accountants and people around them to support them. So what we're working on very hard to do now is to make that really real for them and, and give them a chance to understand the findings. Thank you. And turning to you then, uh, I was supposed to turn to you, but I'm actually <laughs> going to turn to you just first, um, because McCain is uh, leading on sustainability, moving to regenerative agriculture. You're sourcing from these farmers. And um, so in your embracing of that regenerative agriculture, how are you helping your supply base mm. uh, to, to move also in that direction? How are you, for example, using uh, the method methods that, that Sue referred to uh, or do you have other like longer term contracts, price premiums, or can you guide us through how you do that as a corporate? Yeah, of course, and thank you. And just as a quick background, so McCain is the world's largest manufacturer of um, French fries, and we have over 3,500 growers globally, so a pretty big footprint when it comes to um, these topics. So for us, you know, climate change is really impacting our growers every day. We're seeing these crop failures, um, droughts, floods, pests and diseases. So we know we needed to do something. And so a few years ago, we actually commissioned a climate change study which looked at climate variability and, and weather patterns through to 2050. And it really painted a, a bleak picture, actually. So off the back of that, we made our commitment, as you mentioned, to implementing regenerative practices across 100% of our potato acreage by 2030. So for us, this is 100% about grower resiliency. They need to be more resilient to the effects of climate change, um, enhance livelihoods, and also for us to have that security of supply. So in terms of what you mentioned, in terms of how we're actually helping to support and fully understand that there's a lot that is still kind of to be confirmed on, on exact costings and, and things like that, but we wanted to kind of get on with it. And the first thing we did was, was really think about technical assistance. So how we could invest in that through local partnerships with the experts on the ground who know the local soils and, and what is going to help what is going to help our farmers learn what will work best on their on their fields. So we did that um, in a number of different regions, and then we also looked at the financing piece. So completely agree with that, you know, our view is that it w will help the grower be more resilient and more profitable in the long term, but there potentially could be this transition period where we would need to give some extra assistance, extra support now. So we looked at it from a few different perspectives. So one from contracting, as you mentioned, how can we provide long-term contracts? So for example, in France, instead of a three-year contract, we provide a regenerative agriculture contract for six years with a premium on that regenerative produce. Similarly, in the Netherlands, um, a three-year contract there. 
We also looked at partnerships with, with banks and, and financial institutions and tried to kind of understand what role they could play, um, you know, potentially where there are those high cost investments at the beginning on equipment. Um, so providing, uh, you know, discounted interest rate loans, um, incentives. And we've had some great work with NatWest in the UK, Farm Credit Canada, Rabobank in the Netherlands. So very early stages, but looking at how we can learn from those partnerships and see what is working with the growers. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of encapsulates from the, the financing perspective. Yeah. The other key final element I'll add is we need to look at how we de-risk across the whole value chain. And we know that our customers are also an important part of, of the value chain. So we partnered with McDonald's in the UK and in Canada um, to, to invest in Regen Ag. So we created two funds where growers can apply to receive grants and, and benefit from the research of that that they can then take back to their, to their farms. Oh, thank you. Well, this morning we talked about what is regenerative ag, how is it defined? I think there's a, a, probably a question coming from the audience on that, so be prepared. <laughs> um, but I, I think if we're talking about deep regenerative agroecological transformation, we're also, also talking about and mostly talking about people and their input, right? And turning to you then, I think uh, Instituto Regenera has a goal of, of really disrupting mm -hmm. the current production and consumption patterns. Mm -hmm. And you do that through deep co-creation, deep co-design mm -hmm. to really bring along people and different stakeholders that matter. Can you talk about that, how yeah. that works? Yeah, I think I, I want to uh, go back to what is the mindset that uh, generated the idea of Instituto Regenera and the work we do now. So I myself come from uh, cooperatives for food distribution because we couldn't actually find the food that we wanted to consume in the city that I live in, in Sao Paulo. Um, and that was a, an experience for three years. And we noticed that there were several other barriers for those producing agroecological food. And when we started working in Belém, the future host of, of COP30, uh, a couple of years back, four years back, uh, we noticed that they, they, they had more or less the same problems with a, a smaller group of people buying, like Sao Paulo is 10 million people and uh, Belém, the metropolitan area is 2 million people. And then we started with them understanding who is the group that is reselling agroecological food and then we reached the, f the farmers or the producers, sometimes it's indigenous people too, and uh, we made those maps, where food's coming from, where it's being sold. And then after that, we also made uh, a benchmark, which was kind of uh, global, but together with them. What, what did you try in here uh, already? And then from it, we, we made a, a kind of a guide that was for anyone willing to be entrepreneur, already working with food and trying to be better at doing so with agroecological food, which is very specific. We normally say that the avocado doesn't say its history, so you need someone to, to tell the story. And uh, this is the work we are doing now, and we are understanding that this is connecting to public services now, because if people are reselling in the cities, they are more preparing, prepared to go to public procurement. So as, as soon as they organize to resell in the city, and even sometimes the truck is the same for reselling and for bringing to, to school meals. So that is something that helps organize people that way. But I must just uh, state that all that started because supermarket chains are never a partner in this, at least in Brazil. I'm talking about a city where 80% of the food comes from outside our state, and the state of Pará is the size of a country, and uh, we really can't count on supermarket chains. So we are trying to develop our own ways of for own passes for those food to arrive in the city. So it's a little bit about that. Okay, and uh, talking about supermarkets, you're touching on the consumers as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you? And I'm going to ask you the same mm -hmm. question, uh, Jess, as well. So wh what do you? How do you see the role of consumers in this story? What is, what is their impact? What can they ask for? What are they looking for? Um, and, and maybe for you then, how are they shaping up what mm. you are doing? Mm. But they are more and more demanding, uh, especially in a country as Brazil where pesticides are really allowed everywhere. So they are more and more worried about the impacts of that. Although they are niched, uh, I don't know if there is this word in English, which is like they are very specific public still in the agroecological consumption. We have to foster a much broader 
culture of how do you feed yourself? How what is your, you know, uh, food culture? And that is an, a, a much bigger effort than only selling. You have to go to the public sphere, you have to talk to people, and you have to make it cool somehow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just build on that and um, completely agree. I think consumers are, they're savvy, they want transparency, but then they're also exposed to a lot of different sustainability messaging and, and buzzwords. And, and what we found actually was that when we did some research on the term regenerative agriculture, they people didn't really actually know what it meant. Um, so one of the ways we try to overcome that and, and recognizing that there needs to be a, an education piece before you can start you know, going into some of the more uh, technical messages is um, how can we educate them where, where they are at? So one example, in, in, to your reference of being cool, we, tr we try to be cool. <laughs> um, we went on the metaverse and we created a, a game where essentially we created a virtual farm. So we were specifically targeting Gen Zs. They could go onto the farm, they could build their they could build their farm, they could plant their potatoes, harvest, all the while learning what about all the regenerative principles, cover cropping, livestock integration. So we had a great reaction to that. I think it was 35 million visits in the first six weeks. Um, and people were staying on there for around four minutes or so. So seeing that they are staying and they are listening. Um, and that was alongside a, a limited time offer of a product called Regen Fries. So fries made with um, regenerative produce. So we, we only did it in selected markets, again, just to trial and learn and, and see how it went. Um, and then this year, we have been doing some more consumer-facing campaigns in the UK, uh, talking about our commitment. Again, at the moment, re really a real big focus on education, um, showing how we can bring wildflowers into the city, bringing to life some of the principles in a very consumer-friendly way. Yeah. So it's really the consumer as a farmer, right? Yeah, exactly. If I could add yeah. just something. Uh, we have something similar, but we actually bring consumers to the farm to, to, to plant oh. a little bit. So yeah. that is something very, very effective for them to understand what are they eating. So Completely agree. Yeah. And in Australia, does it also happen like that? Uh, or, I mean, you're uncovering a lot of the data for farmers with farmers, but also maybe with consumers? Or how do the farmers use that data? Well, how is it important for them? And yeah, so, f so farming for the future really is focused on the profitability of the farmer and the ability to, to improve their, their own bottom line, so very selfishly focused. Um, but Australia does have a lot of the initiatives that have been mentioned here, and um, Michael Taylor, who's with us today, uh, boasts about having um, over 6,000 people visit his farm, and there's about 6,000 people in the blue zone here today. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> How big is the blue zone compared to the farm? <laughs> <laughs> Have you got that stat ready, Mike? <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think it's all part of, the, it is all part of that business case because if, um, which is why we're sort of focusing on, well, not sort of, we, we are absolutely focused on, on if farmers can actually generate by looking after their natural capital and their natural resources, generate free inputs from nature into their business. And then what is it from the other end that can actually then further bolster that to make sure that farmers are not holding solely the cost and responsibility for looking after nature, that all of the supply chain, in including consumers, is paying their fair share? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to open up to the floor because I'm uh, asking questions, but I'm <laughs> thinking that some people may have questions. I already see a few hands raised. The, com the mic is coming from the back. Yeah. Paddy is in charge. Uh, Debbie Tripley from Compassion in World Farming. Um, I was very interested from, sorry, I don't know your name, yes. the, the McCain um, example. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that your business is very interested in a, in, in a monoculture, essentially growing lots of potatoes. So I, I was interested in how you see farmers being able to cope with growing the sort of yields that you expect in terms of supply chain through a regenerative system? Mm. How, how do they make money out of the other elements of, or do they see themselves l losing money and they're compensated in some way? Just interested in the costs of yeah. no, that's scale, it's, it's I It's a really suppose. good question and we do, yeah, we plant potatoes and depending on the where you are in the world, the um, the number of years of the rotation, so there will be a diversity of crops on the other on the other years. So we are encouraging through, um, and I expect, as you said, the next question might be about how we define region ag, but crop uh, rotation and the diversity of that is a big pillar. So looking at how we can 
look at the markets which will create that demand for the other crops on the other on the other years. So it's, it's something that we're looking at, and it's in terms of some of the other research that we've done in terms of your, your point about yield, is how we can implement this whilst maintaining yields, um, be more efficient. So it's, it's something that we're looking at really closely. As a customer buying McCain Belgian fries, because everybody knows fries were invented in Belgium, <laughs> not in France. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious to know a bit more about what you call regenerative. I mean, you mentioned rotation mm. is one dimension, but what else is behind there? Because I think a lot of the, of the devil is in the detail. detail. Completely. <laughs> so we issued, well, we created a, what we called a potato regenerative agriculture framework a couple of years ago now. And this sets out across a range of different regenerative principles. So crop diversity, uh, biodiversity, armoring soil, livestock integration, water optimization, input optimization, uh, five or six different indicators. And then across different thresholds of providing the detail about what we would be looking for for a grower to achieve against those different levels as they scale up their their knowledge and their ability to implement those practices so we are ultimately looking at an outcome based framework and we've we've been heavily involved in a number of different uh, multi stakeholder initiatives which are looking for that harmonization across the industry so um, OP2B uh, SMI uh, SAI is a key one for us so all of the other kind of players in the food and ag value chain, we can all agree that we, you know, we're looking for outcomes in terms of soil health, biodiversity, water, and then the climate impact. So our framework is really a kind of menu of options that growers can look at and see what will work best on their, their farms. So that's kind of how we define it against those, those four outcomes and then that framework to support them. Hi. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Aslesha. I'm a climate lead at Novozymes. I had a question about, of course, the first one was, what? how do you define Regen Ag? It's obviously one of the key levers that a lot of companies are identifying to abate uh, agriculture-based emissions. But also, what's the role of Regen Ag uh, in terms of cre uh, agriculture that should be more climate resilient and in th the increasing role of adaptation? I think uh, that's something that we don't often talk about over here uh, in terms of the role of agriculture in uh, adapting to climate change. Uh, and I'm just curious to hear from the panel if uh, that's something you guys have thought of or something you can share. Thank you. Yeah. Any volunteers in taking this? Or yeah. I, th I think, yeah, Vijay and then uh, Sue. Yeah. yeah, that's very critical because farmers' resilience to long dry spells or sudden flash rains. So we find uh, region agriculture based crops or what we call as natural farming. So those fields are more resilient and uh, they require less water. I already mentioned we, we are finding savings of water 30 to 50 percent but more important they are resilient to floods, greater resilience to pest attacks and we find with greater crop biodiversity, we don't even encourage application of even botanical pesticides. So we're asking them to get rid of that also. Even if the pests eat some crop, doesn't matter. Then the predator population builds up, then their predators build up. So we are moving them to resilience from both abiotic and biotic stresses. And uh, so with, with Farming for the Future, we actually don't try to define regenerative ag. Um, what we do is by measuring the, the, the different types of ecosystems on a farm, we can say things about how biodiverse the farm is. So we sort of consider that each ecosystem asset has attributes of carbon and biodiversity. So some ecosystems, like an intensified cropping soil, doesn't have very much carbon or very much biodiversity, but produces lots of potatoes. And an intensity, you know, remnant native vegetation, lots of carbon and lots of biodiversity, but doesn't produce very much food. And so that's our general attitude. And what we would say is that somebody who is maintaining the quality of their ecosystem assets or improving it could probably say that they're regenerative. And we think that's a way that we can make sure that 
if you um, are saying to someone you're not regenerative, that you've actually got an evidence base that means that that claim is fair. So that, that's our approach to that. And uh, the reason that we've looked at five years' worth of financial and production data in our study is because um, we've had a nasty drought from 2017 to 2020 and really lovely years since then. And so what we're, our study can do then is it can say, can we see which farms, which natural capital configurations are actually improving resilience? And so, um, it's, it, so it doesn't give us the answers, of course, but it gives us a way to actually work out the answers and give farmers the evidence that they need to make these investment decisions. Just one point I wanted to say. With greater crop biodiversity, the yields of each crop are higher. So there is no penalty. It's a win-win-win. Mm. And maybe, just sorry, one point to add. Uh, we're also looking at um, different varieties of potato, which can be, you know, water stress tolerant. So that's a big part of our, our planning as well. Lassa. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, when you're making the business case for the transition, it often begs the question who you're making the transition for. And often that govern that's governments. And sometimes governments might be inclined to focus more on the bottom line, the GDP. Uh, so focusing on the big productions, the commodity markets, the big scale farmers, as opposed to the smallholders. So is there a trade-off between focusing on big shifts, like shifting five massive farms and thereby making a big shift, as opposed to shifting maybe 200 smallholder farmers? And if, if there is a trade-off between that, how do you overcome it? Uh, yeah, in our case, in our state, we took the stand that since 86% farmers are small and marginal farmers with uh, one hectare as per capita holding, so we'll put all our efforts behind this transition first. The, the farmers above that, medium and big farmers, they are voluntarily adopting it. So it's not, uh, but in this case, you know, we ensure that we go to them repeatedly, motivate them to transition. So, I mean, the in, in, at least in India, so our focus is on small and marginal farmers. We also have a very large number of landless farm workers. So we are helping them to graduate to household food security through homestead gardens. And when they get confidence that through natural farming, they're getting more nutritious vegetables and fruits, so they get the courage to take small land parcels on lease. So our focus is on uh, the most vulnerable and also small farmers. And, and if I could also sorry, address that question quickly, that um, knowledge and information about relationships between natural capital and profitability are extremely powerful because the benefits are uh, openly available to all. And so there is no trade-off because the information is equally available to small and large landholders. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I think we oh, have sorry. one more question <laughs> over there. Yes, it's uh, from our side of the developing country. I, I like the idea of India, if we are going to take it on a landscape basis, like we know everybody in that district or in that village or in that suburb is gradually getting into that, then we don't have a problem. But we have issues where people can capitalize on that. They put out their products and they call them, these have been grown through agroecological way, while we know that they are using all those uh, poison that could be available there. So for me, that's where there's a bit of a gray area. And uh, we really have to be careful not to get opportunists climbing on this one, because now this is the word that is going around. You can do it agroecologically, and it, it is good for you, it is good for that. But how do we know? How do we know in an environment where this farmer is doing, this other farmer is not doing? And we want to build up the system like that they are doing in Andhra Pradesh, where we are confident this village A, everything comes from it. We are all confident in that. I'm not going into certification on all these kind of things, because that has also got its own different challenges. But I'm really worried of people climbing on the ladder of agroecology. And I have seen that. 
I have been in the discussion about agroecology in uh, Uganda, and we went to visit a farmer which is proudly called agroecology, and before we enter into it, the chemical just start hitting us, and we're like, oh my God, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm staying on organic, because I can clearly put the landmark and say you don't fit in. But within this scope, just have to be careful in terms of uh, not getting it being hijacked. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Thank you. Final word to you, and then we will shift the panel around to uh, looking at finance as well, the role of finance. I was just going to, to add, for, for sure, we don't have the, the scalability that Vijay presented, but we do have some social uh, technology coming uh, there from, from the agroecology groups in Brazil, because we first had cert certification, and certification wasn't uh, accessible to several of the smallholders farmers. So the movement developed uh, a specific law, which is a participatory system in which the Minister of Agriculture allows the possibility for them to be certified. They generate a group. Everyone visits each other. And if any of them are, not, uh, are using pesticides, all of them are going to lose their certification. So yeah, exactly. So they are working together and uh, in for sure they are visiting to check on the other's production, but they also learn in the visit. So that's another possibility. Okay, thank you. I, no, sorry. We have to stop because we have more speakers. And uh, I invite you to all continue the conversation uh, after uh, the, the next panel as well, uh, because it's, an, it's, a, it's a difficult story. It's a transition and a transition is not overnight. A transition is not also something that is similar to small-scale farmers, to medium farmers, to large corporates, and we need all of uh, all of us in the room, right? Uh, and it, the transition will, will look different. I, I hear the point that we need to be careful not to have the term regenerative hijacked. Uh, definitely not. Uh, and that's what we need to take care about and, and really discuss these points. What do we measure? Uh, what are we looking at? Do we look at nature? Do we look at carbon? Do we look at social aspects? Uh, and what kind of innovations are there? And you have a lot to tell, a lot more to tell, so attack them when they're over there. <laughs> but uh, for now, thank you. Give a hand to these uh, four wonderful speakers. And if you can just sit in, the, in these. And then I would welcome Tanya Havemann from uh, the director of Claire Mondial uh, to the seat. <laughs> as well as Julia Wolf, Natural Resource Manager at FAO, and also co-author of a new report on enabling private sector investment for sustainable ag, right? Private sector investment, sustainable ag. So you can, you can spread out. <laughs> So while they're getting their, uh, their gear fixed, um, let me introduce a little bit. Role of finance is key in making the business case, right? We heard about the role of subsidies. We heard about the role of investment from, uh, from corporates, uh, from, from banks. Um, there's different source of finance, different types of, of capital that need to come in. Uh, at the IKEA Foundation, we're a philanthropy. Philanthropic capital has a role to play. Uh, Vijay Kumar uh, referred to that as well. And together with the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, which is a, a, a membership alliance of, of many philanthropies and, and the support of other uh, peer philanthropies, Rockefeller and the Children's Investment Fund, we've, um, we've gone through a bit of a process of getting all the philanthropies together to think about what our role is in this transition, what our funding is, and what is actually needed <laughs> to make the transition from different sources of finance. Um, there's a report that came out just recently called Cultivating Change. Um, and that showed very much in line with other reports that have come out that uh, currently actually there's about 44 billion available for making the shift to regenerative or agroecological um, uh, practices and transformation. Uh, and only like half a million per year is coming from philanthropy. Uh, 11 million from, uh, sorry, billion uh, from uh, private sector and uh, much more from the public sector. 
philanthropic capital needs to grow. And we together as philanthropies commit to grow our capital, to deepen also the, the capital that we have, make it longer term, make it more rooted or grounded to really uh, reach the farmers, but also to make it more um, of a leverage for the big money. The big money being that of private sector and especially so from the public sector. And the two speakers that we have here uh, will talk about those two perspectives. Um, so Tanya, uh, you are uh, the director of Claire Mondial, an investment company. Uh, an investment company that, that focuses on mobilizing finance, specifically for green uh, funds. Um, you have a latest investment fund called the Biosphere Integrity Fund. Uh, that really seeks to address these challenges of, of climate change, biodiversity loss, and social inequity at the same time. How do you do that? Where do you, how do you measure things? And what kind of innovations do you implement? Great. Thanks for that. I think, um, well, first of all, that fund is not fine. It's still in design phase at the moment, but we're, we're really excited about the opportunities that we see already. So just in terms of uh, so the role of finance and how we see that finance can be really useful, it's actually in terms of promoting accountability. Um, we already launched one fund called the Food Securities Fund, uh, which we launched in March 2021, which allows us to actually finance some of those leading value chains that have an impact on smaller farmers and also on the climate and on biodiversity loss. And um, it was really important for us to start actually financing some of these businesses to learn about, you know, what are their constraints and how can finance be a tool to improve. And then I think also as a, as a financier, we have the privilege of asking for information that other stakeholders might not be able to ask for because it's a covenant in the loan agreement or it's a requirement for them to get more money. And uh, we're seeing that that's a huge uh, tool that can be wielded quite powerfully. Um, we see the need for both improving the terms of existing financing for uh, value chains and groups within the value chain sector, as well as more intentional longer term financing to really support the transition. So on the first fund that we developed and that we're scaling called the Food Securities Fund, that was really about bringing additional source of working capital financing into these supply chains. And uh, with the second fund that we're developing, the Biosphere Integrity Fund, what we'll be doing is really looking at a specific sourcing area or critical sourcing areas and supply sheds and together with other stakeholders there, really looking intentionally at what are the changes that we need to see in these uh, supply chains over the next sort of decade or so, and then you know how do we finance those appropriately. I think the other thing that we're seeing in terms of innovations that we've applied both on existing fund as well as will also be applied on the Biosphere Integrity Fund is that we think that while it's really useful to have blended finance, and we do benefit from that, from the first fund in terms of a guarantee from the US Development Finance Corporation, we see that the private sector actually should take first risk in some of these transitions. And um, we've managed to do that with the Food Securities Fund where we've gotten corporates to uh, de-risk on a transaction level. And with the second fund, the Biosphere Integrity Fund, we are also looking for them to risk share. We think that everyone needs to take on a little bit more risk. Everyone needs to shift a little bit in order to actually make these things uh, financeable. And um, that's what we're doing. So I think the main innovations are in terms of um, really understanding the financing pain points within a value chain and a supply shed, um, getting different partners that actually have a business interest, be that from the farmer or to farmers' organizations, all the way to traders and manufacturers to actually take more risk, sometimes even governments to share risk with the financial sector, um, and then having a long-term vision for those supply sheds. And I think the other last thing I want to say on the new fund, um, some, sometimes the challenge is not necessarily within the agricultural sector itself. For example, we were looking at a transaction in Indonesia and everyone is very keen to sort of transition the supply shed into a more kind of regenerative or organic. Um, but the problem was that the government is just dumping huge amounts of um, chemical pesticides on the side of the roads. And so, you know, even if the agricultural sector wanted to do something, it's actually the road department in that province in Indonesia that's the problem. So... I think just trying to look at what are the different sectoral linkages, be they in energy or water or food, um, and how do we have a longer-term vision that involves relevant stakeholders and get them to, to share risk and take on more accountability. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's a good bridge also to my question I want to, to ask to you, Julia. So you've co-authored a new uh, FAO report called Enabling Private Sector Investment for Climate Action in Agriculture. And that really speaks about how 
national plans can be instrumental. So bringing together different stakeholders, but also uh, going across the silos of departments and maybe involving the roadworks as well. <laughs> Um, but the report highlights that there is an increased effort also from private sector in, in taking, uh, taking on regenerative or agroecological um, uh, investments, uh, but it, it all remains a little bit at pilot scale. So how can governments then really uh, enable these agri-food companies and, and how can governments work across the silos and, and work with uh, the likes of Claire Mondial as well, perhaps? What kind of measures do you see? Okay, um, thank you so much and uh, congrats to, to the topic setting of this event. Um, I'd just like to maybe start with a number of, of figures, which um, you may know or not, but I think it's really important to always think, okay, we're here at COP28 and in a recent FAO report, we actually noticed that in the last 10 years, the, the portion of agriculture from uh, the climate finance agriculture is getting from the big pot is, is actually declining for 20%. No? So we need the private sector because it's very clear that the public sector doesn't provide enough. Um, so it's a good question on, on how can this all happen. Um, what I also like to flag as a second number is that if you look at the um, NDCs, the National Determined Contribution, which is part of the Paris Agreement kind of commitments, as you all know, it is actually 95% of the the countries do mention agriculture as a key priority, out of which uh, the private sector um, is mentioned with 41%, um, and 60% uh, of this 41% reference to the private sector is actually on agriculture. Now, so we have all in place, let's say, to have wonderful funds really stepping up. Um, I think one of the key, the key challenges, if I s can start with the, the challenges, is that these instruments are often like framework, ambition-setting instruments, but they're not operational. And this is probably where the, where the big gap is. Um, and, and this is where, for example, FAO, and, and we just to mention one of the programs we are running, um, it's, it's called Scaling Up Climate Ambition on Land Use and Agriculture, SCALA, like scale in short. And, and there we work with 12 countries with German financing in really um, taking this next step, now really working on the enabling environment um, to really um, bring these plans into a fundable uh, or bankable project together with the private sector uh, because th it's, it's a communication and, and preparation um, problem in, in many cases. And what we find there is it just, I mean, there are key five key points I'd like to mention. Often um, it's not, um, the, the targets mentioned in the NDCs are not specific enough for the subsectors. No? So it's like, where's the entry points? Where's really uh, where the communication can happen in terms of ambition, ambition setting? The, the, the lack of um, the institutional frameworks. Often you have very like negative, I mean, you have to, the tax system is not right. There's import barriers, right? So there's a lot of things that need to be reviewed to make it more attractive and, and to, for the private sector to take risk. Um, then there's um, um, one of the key um, matters we, we also see in this report you mentioned, and thanks for flagging that, is one of the key problems is, is actually that um, it, it, the, the risk assessment is not sufficiently done, because that's also money. No? So the, 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 the bankable projects need to have a really in-depth our risk assessment done before the, the private sector or doing it with the private sector so you can kind of, with the public sector, kind of um, increase the, the likelihood, let's say, for, for the private sector to coming in with finance. And um, one of the other things I, I also like to flag, and I kind of heard it also in the first panel, is, is the lack of focus. So there's two things now. So often, I mean, money always goes where mo more money can be made. No? So we have a problem of least developed countries ha are really underlooked. No? So more support needs to be for least developed countries and also more farmer focused. It's often very much medium scale companies or collaborative um, cooperation that, that enjoy this kind of um, uplift of the topic and, and um, the um, kind of the, the high importance, but we really need to shift to the most vulnerable. And we also had that very strongly in, in the first panel. And it doesn't matter so much, maybe that's as the last point, um, it doesn't so matter so much um, how it's called. And that's also something I'd like to maybe connect back to with the first panel. I think we have a fraction with all these terminologies, w which are really important in itself. No? But in, in FAO, for example, 
we don't work with the, neck, the definition. They often come to us, Effie, how do you define regenerative agriculture? We just were like having agroecology. So sometimes we're not doing ourselves a favor and getting stuck and fragmented rather than really working as a community on, on kind of pushing this whole envelope of agriculture, food security, name it. No? So for, for FAO, one of the reference points is the, the wording in the Paris Agreement, the wording of the agriculture negotiators, which meet at four o'clock if you want to come as an observer. Um, it, it's really, it's on the course. It's not so much how it's called. And then, of course, it, it's the choice of farmers and, and countries how they want to name it. Yeah, you don't name it agroecological or regenerative at all, right, in the Biosphere Integrity Fund. What do you use as term? I think we're just looking at sort of sustainable landscapes and value chains. I think it's just, I mean, the, the fund will be an impact fund as well. So, I mean, we, we are regulated as an impact fund under European regulations. And there uh, we have impact objectives in terms of, you know, climate and biodiversity and livelihoods and gender. And we will have long-term targets on those things. And with climate, obviously, it's easy, you know, tons of CO2 e equivalent. But on the biodiversity side, it's, I mean, it's impossible to compare, you know, a site where someone is doing, uh, you know, re restoration of degraded cattle land in Costa Rica or compared to, like, you know, some landscape in Senegal. I mean, the types of indicators that you would look at to track biodiversity gains are completely different. So for every transaction, we're looking at having an impact theory of change that includes at least you know, climate and biodiversity elements that then kind of tack up to the overall level. But mm -hmm. it's difficult to keep up with all these terms. I mean, first of all, climate smart agriculture, sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Right. So, so maybe uh, having a discussion with Sue on farming for the future and, and making nature valuable uh, would, be, would be helpful in this one uh, to see how it works in that. But it also has to work for people, so. Exactly. True. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, just a few minutes left, and uh, I think our last speaker is not here yet, so we will skip that part. Uh, but that means that we do have some questions for f uh, from you, uh, time for questions from you. So if there is anybody with a question, then please go for it. Yes, so I'd like to uh, uh, learn more about the impact investment. Uh, like you said, uh, number one is how do you measure your return that is number one and then in um, in a, a finance system there's the uh, not performing loan uh, rate so uh, what is your NPL rate then should I start I think those are that relates me to needs me to another innovation that we have on our on our financing structures so um, on the first fund that we developed which is able to do unsecured pre-harvest financing to SMEs and emerging development markets, we can do that because we have a blended finance structure. And the way that's innovative is not just blended from development finance assistance, we're blending first with, with private sector. So we're able to do loans, like for example, we have a loan in Burkina Faso, we have an, in Benin, so we have an, in LDCs, but we're able to do that because they're anchored by value chains where there are, you know, further down the line, more credit worthy uh, off-takers who are interested in buying that product and have a long-term relationship with those supply chains and are willing to provide the fund with an unfunded first loss guarantee. So that means that while, you know, it would be crazy to go and get money from a pension fund in Europe and say, we're going to put it, we're going to give an unsecured loan to this company in Burkina Faso with smaller farmers and it's great. Um, that sounds crazy, right? But we're able to do that because we have uh, first loss capital on a transaction level, not on a fund level. Uh, with larger companies that are, have an interest in that loan. And then on top of that, we have, in the fund's initial period, a uh, $37.5 million guarantee from the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, which we're graduating out over time. On Biosphere Integrity Fund, it will be a longer term. The loans will be longer term, so they'll be 10 years plus minus. We'll be able to look more flexibly at things like revenue sharing. And again, you know, the idea is for com companies to take... Um, participate in the risk of the specific transactions because we don't think it either that it makes sense to load all the risk onto the smallholder farmers because they're the ones that tend to be able to carry that risk the least. And so that will be, we'll be looking more at sort of structured project finance transactions where we, we can sort of isolate some of the risks and potentially also some of the revenues that are coming from those uh, improved practices. On terms of the impact side, um, you know, it, uh, unfortunately, you know, you kind of have to end up simplifying things to make them to communicate them effectively. Um, so we, the fund, 
will be what is called an SFDR Article 9 fund. In Europe, we have regulations around being able to be called an impact or sustainable fund, which are quite strict. And that means you have to disclose on certain things like greenhouse gas footprint, you know, gender diversity boards, and those kind of things. And then if you're an Article 9 fund, you have additional categories that you've added into your um, impact theory of change where you have to, to specify how you, like, how you intend to monitor that. And so every year on the existing fund and also on the new fund, we have an, an audit. So we have to collect information and be audited on those things. I think what will be complicated with the second fund is just topics like biodiversity or improvements to watershed health, which is another category that we're looking at, is you know, how do we actually prioritize the most important impact indicators within a supply shed? Um, so yeah, I think it, it's complicated, but you know, the, the headline ones are easier to understand, but then kind of when you go down to it, by necessity, it gets complicated. Hi, uh, Anthony Dane from Just Transition Lab in South Africa. So a slightly different angle and it links into some challenges and maybe to the point around silos and just one of our challenges around finance. So we're, we're entrepreneurs trying to drive Just Transition projects um, on the ground responding to the calls for those and we've got a range of experiments and pilots and one of the pilots is specifically around trying to repurpose a coal mine. And so we've got an underground hydroponics plant going in there. One of the economic diversification options that we're looking at to create new jobs and you know economic opportunities is around regenerative agriculture. It's an opportunity area. But we're struggling to unlock that opportunity. Um, and part of the frustration that I feel in this is that we are partly in the just energy transition space. We're partly in the mining space, but then we're not in critical minerals, right? We're partly in the agri space, but then we don't quite sing in this space. So we're in this kind of little sort of horrible trench of not quite in anyone's sort of perfect spot. But at the same time, we feel like this is exactly, certainly in our context, what we need to sort of contribute to the broad just transition space. So, I, I mean, it doesn't sound like it sings with respect to your fund, for example, but I'm just interested in what advice or thoughts you have around how to take those kinds of integrated projects forward. Wonderful question. Uh, do you have an answer to that? <laughs> it's, potentially, it's potentially a very cynical answer, so forgive me. Um, but I think it's to just to be able to be able to be able to tailor your message in terms of the audience. I mean, unfortunately, you know, people that are looking for money are the ones looking for money. And while everyone says there's loads of climate finance out there and there's so much capital, I mean, the truth of the matter is there. Yeah, there's loads of capital for the likes of BlackRock with, you know. Mm. I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars in deals of that size. But for some of the really important um, projects that are just getting started or that are nascent, I mean, I think for project developers or, or leaders, I think it's just being able to learn to speak to specific donors um, and then sort of tailor your message to that, which sounds awfully cynical, but this is the truth. And then I think from the perspective of, of funders and foundations, I think it would be great to see more capital be available to actually do transactions and for groups to actually take risk and implement rather than you know doing workshops or tools or you know while that's important i think we also need to have more money rather than doing calls to action actually doing action so and from a from a public perspective maybe how do you how would you answer the question well i, I think it's a very good question um i mean the way you describe um the problem, it's the same problem we have here in the UNFC space, now where agriculture now gained recognition in, in this political space. And the question, I mean, yesterday was this big leader declaration of 134 countries signing off at the head of uh, government um, level and, and committed politically. And so I think that's it, it's pushing the agenda on all kinds of different angles. But on your specific um, question, one of the shortcomings we saw in, in the publication is that the scope three emission, which is basically not the direct product emission, and, and also not directly, it's really the value chain emission. It, it's a very technical term, but but it basically means looking at the whole chain and looking at all the emissions. Um, and, and I think that's often, um, and you can correct me if that, that's not considered sufficiently um, in the existing portfolio. It's not like it's, it's, it's too narrow for, for all these benefits we've been speaking in the first panel, right? So the, the, I think this is where the innovation needs to happen. This is where social innovation needs to be priced. This is where 
Um, the, I mean, the, the question was who has actually cur the courage to price things in, in the right way? No, it's back to what, what we all learned in university. No? So is that happening? Is that the transformation we, we can see and hope for over time? I think this is what we have to work on also from a public perspective, like on a, on a method and help people like you trying to push in, in the right direction at the, at the national and local level. Okay, thank you. We are at time, so I want to just give you maybe the, the honor of closing. Uh, if you have something to say, maybe a call to all of us, because we're all responsible uh, as financiers, as uh, people who are doing things on the ground, like you are doing, Dane, people who are thinking about how we can structure deals, how we can influence policy. Well, how can we come together? Uh, and what is, what is needed to, uh, to drive the business case and enable finance. <laughs> Just like that on the spot, Tanya, you can do it. Um, I think one thing that it would be great to see universally is perhaps more, more empathy or understanding of how certain decisions that are taken within institutions affect others. We see that a lot within the value chain, so large corporates, and I, don't, I think McCain is an ex exception, so congratulations, is that, you know, they put in place, um, you know, targets or requirements on their suppliers um, and they, you know, magically think the suppliers and the people downstream from that, like smaller farmers, are going to be able to have the capacity and the resources to shift to meet those needs, but they're not necessarily changing, you know, their pricing terms, you know, how quickly they pay farmers, what upfront funding they support, or have thought about, you know, what are the financial implications of, of trying to make the shift. So I think it's great that, you know, the world is starting to look to shifting towards more agroecological systems and regenerative agriculture and climate smart agriculture. But I think it's really important to think about how that actually impacts the people that are the most vulnerable and you know what we can do to isolate them from taking on additional risk, including financial risk, and um, how we can sort of yeah include them in the process so that their concerns are also heard. Thank you. Yeah. Key insights. Maybe in just one or two sentences, really quickly? Well, I think um, for me, the what needs to really change is that agriculture becomes part of a foreign affairs policy. It's, it, we're too much in an agriculture box. It's too much, you know, so I like the impact fund, but it's not just the impact. So it's really like, is it really reaching? So we need to have a tracking system in terms of, is it really making a difference for the local people? But then also globally, I think it needs to be better understood that it's, uh, it, it's agriculture is a question of peace, of um, of global food security, and it's much more than just the agriculture sector is responsible for it. No, so this needs to shift in some way, and and I guess we're all working on that as well. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your questions and attention. Give us a big hand. To you.